All right, thank you. Welcome back, everyone. We thank you so much for your participation today. A, a special thanks to the, the Commission on Teacher Credentialing, uh, whose grant provided the time today, and the, uh, the Center for California Teacher Careers, uh, and uh, running the backbone of this, uh, and also to my three research partners, Drs. Gentilucci, Samosa Norton, and Newman, who are collecting data for our research brief today. Uh, we have a wonderful panel that is going to wrap up our, our discussion today, uh, which includes individuals um, from across the state with multiple levels of experience. And, and I'm gonna let each of them as we go forward briefly introduce themselves and their bios are, are printed but you're hearing from experts in the field across the state at multiple levels today. And, and I wanna start off with our panelists and, and we're gonna start with, with Jack and I'll just keep going across the, 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 my screen here. Um, what, after introducing yourself, Jack, uh, briefly, what's an effective strategy that you've observed that has helped address some of our recruitment and retention challenges? Great. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brescia. It's a real treat and an honor to be here again. I remember two years ago being with you when we were in Sacramento, and I can remember three years ago with you when we were at the at the Capitol uh, in, in the legislative room where we had all of the key players as well. So thank you for your leadership role on this. You and Linda Darling-Hammond is a reason that there's so much money in the budget addressing the teacher pipeline issue. And it's due in large part to uh, your work, Linda's work, and, and so many others, uh, but it's been your leadership, so, uh, so thank you. And then Jim asked me uh, earlier, he said, Jack, we really want you here for more of the historical perspective, but I wasn't sure if he meant historical or hysterical. So I'm prepared to go either way with you uh, on this, Jim. But uh, Jack O'Connell is my name. I actually right now am less than 10 miles physically away from Dr. Brescia in the County of San Luis Obispo office. And I'm a teacher by profession, product of our public school system, public university system, uh, CSU system. And uh, then I had the pleasure of serving on a county board of education in Santa Barbara, and uh, which I sometimes think was the pinnacle of my influence uh, uh, in terms of my legislative career. And it did have a chance to serve 20 years in the California State Legislature and served as eight years as California State Superintendent of the Public Instruction. I'm one of the founding members of Capital Advisors. Uh, and so with, with that, Jim, to try to address your, your issue on effective strategy, um, I think that what the governor is attempting to do in the budget this year uh, in terms of uh, uh, in helping us with the education uh, pipeline, the educators pipeline issue uh, is, is more than I've ever seen. They tried last year and then we had this thing called COVID and of course it all got uh, eliminated. But due to the fact that you've helped keep this issue around the teacher shortage, Linda has uh, as well, uh, using your positions of influence and guidance and leadership. Uh, I mean, I'm really, really pleased with where the initial version was uh, with the state budget, the mentorship program, the teacher residency grant program. Uh, the governor put in $550 million uh, to help us with this. Now the legislature has uh, basically cut it in half. And the reason they've done that is they're trying to shave a whole lot of programs to try to get more money to address things like the uh, PERS and STIRS issue and eliminate all the deferrals to help school districts uh, long-term. Uh, so I get that, those are some of the tough decisions. But the current subject areas, you know, that we've been talking about for years, it's not new, uh, the shortage in special education, uh, bilingual teachers, uh, STEM, and any other of the shortage areas that have been identified by CTC. And the legislature wants to add right now TK uh, and kindergarten uh, in, in these, this program as well. And if uh, the governor is successful and the legislature, and I believe they will, TK is going to in the next couple of years uh, be the 14th grade level uh, for our K through 12 uh, system that we talk about. And then finally, I'd just like to close. I've, I've been with you since the beginning of this, and I've been very pleased to hear so many of the professional comments 
that relationships are so important. Relationships with your local teacher preparation program. Uh, more of our teachers are being prepared online. Develop relationships with some of these online candidates. Uh, student teachers uh, as well. Uh, you get these folks on your campus that become part of your culture. Uh, hopefully they live in your community and want to live there, but that's going to help us address the teacher shortage issue as well. Thank you, Jack. Um, and uh, again, after introducing yourself, uh, Rigel is our Deputy Legal Counsel for the State Board of Education. And, and Rigel, briefly introduce yourself and what are you seeing as an effective strategy that you would advocate? Thank you so much, Dr. Brescia, and hi, everyone. My name is Rigel Massaro. I'm Deputy Legal Counsel and Deputy Policy Director at the State Board of Education. Um, just came in in, in November, it's like a seven short months ago, feels like, well, time is strange these days, as we know. Um, and uh, I, I began um, my, my role in education. I was an intern teacher uh, and, uh, and became a teacher through the Teach for America program before going to law school. But I, I actually, one of the reasons I went into teaching is I was working with a lot of immigrant families and doing union organizing and heard so many of them describe that they came here because they wanted their kids to get a great education. And that just, that hit me so hard. And it really made me want to work with immigrant youth that when I was in college and, and brought me into teaching. Um, out of, out of law school, I, I represented uh, immigrant parents who had students with disabilities in New York City, and then um, for several years uh, was an attorney at Public Advocates, um, mostly doing policy work and implementation work around the local control funding formula and teacher issues around recruitment and retention, high quality teaching. Um, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to work at the State Board. I'm thrilled to be working for Dr. Linda Darling-Hammond. Um, and and you know, Jack took so many of my talking points, right? So the governor, the governor came in, selected Dr. Darling Hammond to lead in the state board. And I think with that selection, you know, really forecast the emphasis on teachers and teaching and high quality teaching. I mean, this is, you know, Linda Darling Hammond is, a, is an internationally and certainly nationally known um, resource on this topic. Um, and so really coming out strong and, and, and focusing on building our preparation, um, incentivizing folks to come into teaching, and once we're there, supporting them to grow. And so, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, the, the suite of, of activities we've seen going um, under, you know, under this administration and immediately prior have proven effective. We've seen take up, and I'm sure Kara will mention this, but around our classified um, credentialing program, around residencies, when the fund Funds are, are given to the field, they are taken up and used in implementing new programs. We're doing grow your own programs, diversifying the teacher workforce, which you know we're, we're understanding now really for the first time ever the importance of having a workforce that reflects our student population. Um, and, and, you know, after this year, we really have had a year that highlights the role of teachers and, and the difficulty that it is teaching and how we need to support teachers to support students um, and how we're all, we're all humans for just larger and small versions with multifaceted needs. And so um, I really, you know, this is where some of this professional development funds in the budget comes from to um, ensure that teachers have the capacity themselves um, to, to get the support they need to support students' diverse needs. So, um, um, you know, my sense is that, you know, we've we've been funding some very effective strategies. And, and as Jack describes, we're, we're doubling down and expanding. Um, so uh, and I can go into those in a moment, but I'll stop there. Thank you, Rigel. Um, Lewis, uh, you have been somewhat the, the voice of education every week, uh, at least for me professionally in the last several years. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what have you observed recently as an effective strategy? A pleasure and a privilege to be with all of you and familiar faces and all the folks out there who really are doing the important work. Um, Lewis Friedberg, I've been running uh, EdSource for the last 10 years, actually just recently stepped down from that role so I could get back to doing more writing and reporting and uh, to focus on some of the, the issues that we're talking about today. Um, you know, one of, I think one of the, um, I won't say untold stories, but least told stories is the work of the California Teacher Credentialing Commission, which has done, uh, you know, has really been working on this issue for many years. 
And uh, we've tried to cover it at, at source, probably haven't done as good a job as we could have. Um, I was talking with uh, Mike Kirst uh, yesterday, one of my first in the field lunches <laughs> to see Mike down in Cupertino. And uh, he, he feels that uh, what the CTC have been doing over the last 10, 15 years is one of the untold stories of California education. And um, actually uh, next week, I was just looking at the agenda coming up. Um, I see that the CTC is gonna be recommending to Governor Newsom that he declare an emergency. Uh, state of emergency around this, uh, you know, teacher recruitment issue, uh, in order to uh, get through a reform of the subject matter test, which lots of teachers couldn't take because there were fewer uh, test administrations, and so now there's a big reform on the table that will allow prospective teachers to pass that subject matter test by looking at the work, the courses that they had taken in college, for example. Um, so this is, I would, you know, on one level, a technical reform, but on another level, an important reform, um, because it could free, you know, uh, uh, open up the logjam of getting more teachers uh, into the, through the pipeline and into the classroom. Um, I'll just say one thing, because, and this has also been a challenge, I have to say, to cover all these programs, all this money on the table, very hard to keep track of, all very exciting. But the key thing is that these programs have to work. Uh, so getting the programs introduced, getting the money on the table is really just the first step. And um, I'll just mention again, this is something that will be looked at at the CTC. I know Kari, don't want to steal your thunder, but next week at the meeting, uh, it would appears to be a successful program and the governor has now put a lot more money into this, is, which is the classified staff recruitment program. Uh, but every year there's evaluations of this program and there are major issues with actually fulfilling the full potential of those programs, getting enough people to sign up for the program. Um, um, this, the, the, the recruits themselves, um, because these are often people who have other jobs and, uh, you know, being able to break away and enroll in programs is very difficult. And another thing that I had never thought of is the managers of these programs. There's a high turnover of the people who are administering and supervising these classified employees. So this is an example of we have a program that appears to be very promising, but we have to drill down and really look at what's working and not working and to really make sure that it works. Because I think one of the unfortunate things, not only with this program, but with all the reforms that are, that are in play, we don't want to be in five years, 10 years, oh, we did that, we invested billions of dollars and we didn't achieve uh, what uh, these programs were intended to achieve. So it's really gonna take a collective effort. And the last thing I'll say is the, the, the problem or the challenge with the teacher recruitment issue, there's no one solution. There's no one single solution. This is a multi-layered, multi-pronged approach that is gonna take work at all levels of the system. And so I mean, there's not gonna be one thing like this classified uh, teacher recruitment program. It's just one small but important piece of it. And all these pieces are important. And so that's a challenge for the entire field to keep all these different programs, initiatives going. But um, I know we've got a core of incredible people in this room, uh, this virtual room, who uh, I know are up to the task. So I'll, I'll stop at that. Thank you. Uh, well, I think you perfectly teed that up for, for Hannah there um, as our, our, our researcher uh, in the virtual room here. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself and, and what do you see, again, looking at this through your lens? Thank you, Dr. Brescia. It's such a deep honor and I'm humbled to be here today. So I work with um, the Education Trust West. We are a nonprofit educational equity organizations and we're focused on closing opportunity gaps through research data policy analysis and advocacy. And one of our key policy pillars is educator diversity. So I'll be sharing through that lens today. And um, Jim, to your question about one effective strategy, I'm gonna double down on what Mr. O'Connell 
mentioned earlier is people and relationships. I know there are many higher education partners on the call today. Um, I wanna just share a few examples of partnerships between higher ed and LEAs that we've observed. So I wanna share a quote by Dean Shireen Pavri with CSU Long Beach. It truly, takes, it truly does take a village. It's about finding new partners, nurturing relationships and refreshing relationships. So we know that we learned that CSU Long Beach and, and um, Long Beach Unified partner really well on clinical placements of their teacher candidates, especially in math and science. And the education program at Long Beach also recruits directly from the math and science departments to get undergraduates to enter the STEM teaching pipeline. And we've also learned that Riverside County, uh, County Office of Education, they partner with CSU San Bernardino to recruit men of color to become teachers. And they have a really critical mentoring component in that they place young men of color with um, mentors with whom they share an affinity. So having that racial affinity um, as a mentoring strategy is really critical for retention. And we've also learned that through the California Teaching Fellows Foundation, they're piloting a rural residency program because they know that not all teachers want to go teach in the big cities where many of the residencies are. And they're partnering with 20 universities across um, the Central Valley. So Tulare, Fresno, Merced, King County. Um, and one more is many of you might know the, Compt the a Compton Male Teacher of Color Network, which is really focuses on retention. And they're also partnering with CSU Northridge and also Dr. Travis Bristol at UC Berkeley. And I also wanna say, I would be remiss not to thank Superintendent Thurman because he convened um, an educated diversity advisory group at CDE, which Dr. Bristol chairs. And we've had the pri privilege of learning so much about promising programs across the state through that advisory group. Thank you. Um, and, and from the perspective of the commission, uh, uh, Cara Mendoza is a, is a senior administrator, or I should say seasoned administrator um, in the, uh, the CTC. And um, from your perspective, after introducing yourself, what are you seeing? Thank you, Dr. Brescia, and thank you uh, for the invitation today. I am standing in for Dr. Mary uh, Vixie Sandy. Uh, those are very large shoes to stand in, so I'm going to stand in my own shoes today, uh, speaking as an educator of 35 years in the in California. Um, I've been a high school English teacher. I've been a co-director of the California Writing Project in elementary principal and an induction coordinator in a, local, in a Northern California uh, school district. And I've only been at the commission since 2018. I came on board as the grants consultant. What amazing place to, to um, end my career as a grants consultant with all this amazing energy around supporting and recruiting and retaining uh, teachers. And um, recently in the last year became an administrator in the professional services division overseeing exams, data visualizations and grants. So I'm, I too am honored to be here. Um, you know, I can, I can, everyone has already spoken to the amazing classified grant program, the teacher residency programs. We've had undergraduate uh, integrated programs that have shown much success. Um, and all the opportunities from um, the state government, from the governor and um, with, you know, leading, being led by our Linda Darling Hammond. I can speak to um, being a brand new teacher out of a credential program and feeling so disconnected from the real world of education simply because I, there was no connection at that time, right? You know, you were a student teacher and when you were done with the program, it was kind of like good luck finding a job. And in 35 years ago, it wasn't as, um, uh, there might've been a, a, a little bit of a lack of uh, need for teachers also. Um, and so the concept of teacher residency where the LEAs from the beginning of that teacher's career during student teaching, they embrace the teachers and invite them into their community and work with the IEG around what is needed in that particular LEA community, I think speaks volumes to that relationship piece and to that connection from the beginning and really embracing educators into your community. And the fact that we have classified grants that can embrace our community members and invite them to a new track toward teacher, to, towards being a teacher also, um, is, is really amazing. So 
yes, the money is out there. And yes, now is the time to start gathering those best practices. Uh, luckily, we our teacher residency programs have been working with the residency lab, which is um, uh, supported by the CDE Foundation. And I think it's really time now that people have their feet wet, even during a pandemic, <laughs> to bring every people together to start talking about best practices and sustainability. So I'm very happy to be part of this work today and all the ongoing work we do with, with this work. So thank you. Thank you, Cara. And, and Wes, as the, the leader of uh, the, the largest administrative uh, organization, definitely in the state, if not the country, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and some of your perspectives. Yeah, Dr. Brescia, thanks for um, convening this symposium. Uh, first and foremost. And to all the, the practitioners that are participating, the, the biggest thank you to all of you for doing the heroic work you do every day to support California's 6.2 million students. Um, and that's why AXE is honored to be here. Our, our students deserve nothing but the best support um, that we can provide them. And yeah, I, I want to lift up as well that while we're talking about the really important issue of the teacher shortage, um, we, we can't forget that we have an educator shortage in California, not just a teacher shortage. We have a shortage of classified uh, professionals all across the state. And in some geographic areas, it's very severe. We have a shortage of um, qualified school district and county leaders. Lewis mentioned that, and we all know the research on inexperienced leadership and what that does to student success and outcomes. And so we've got to address this educator uh, shortage and, and the pipeline issues there. One of, one of the strategies that I've seen, and as I was thinking about this last night, I got a call from a buddy who was at the Harley dealership and um, he was getting ready to, to ride his boss's Harley home because his boss bought a Harley, doesn't have a helmet, doesn't have a motorcycle license and doesn't know how to ride a motorcycle. And I thought, you know, um, as I think about best practices, uh, the, the LEAs in California that are doing a great job of recruiting and retaining, they get their house in order first. So before they put all this effort into recruitment strategies, they make sure that that, that organization is inclusive and supportive. Um, that when people get there, uh, they're successful, they're supported, uh, they have those relationships with bits and coaching and, and all the things they do. And um, Ed Trust West does a great job of lifting up educator diversity and the lack thereof that it's not representative of the students we serve. Uh, and especially in those environments, we have to make sure that our house is in order, that it is inclusive, that people feel welcomed and supported. And then the recruitment pays off because people stay in the profession um, and they succeed and once again, and most importantly, their students succeed. And so I think that's one of the strategies that I would just lift up. Get your house in order before you spend all this money and time with these nifty campaigns to recruit people. Uh, let's make sure that they can be successful once we, once we recruit them. Thank you, Wes. And, and, and finally, uh, Donna, um, as the leader of the California Center in Teaching Careers, uh, briefly introduce yourself and then describe um, something that you've observed as an effective strategy uh, in the most recent. So I came to um, California actually as a credentialed special ed teacher from New York City, um, thinking actually I was so disillusioned with education that I was going to change careers. Um, however, when I got to California, my husband got a job and at the time, um, I think I couldn't enroll right away at school, so I thought I'd start subbing. Of course, once they heard I had a special ed credential, I had a lot of eyes in my classroom and was quickly recruited. Um, what I did find is all those things that both you, Wes, and Jack have been talking about is the district that I was employed by, which at the time was Visalia Unified, did all those things. Uh, they went out of their way to make me really feel part of a community, certainly coming from New York and adjusting, which was a big adjustment, going from um, you know, New York City to um, Visalia, California. 
And, um, but it made me think twice about leaving the field. And as a result of all that nurturing, I became an administrator. I um, was a director of special ed. I also um, worked as a principal of a high school and then came back um, and came to the county office early in 2000 um, with the initial recruitment center. We had the Central California Recruitment Center. So we've been around um, and shortly after hired Marvin Lopez and as our partnership really developed, we found all those strategies by two things. One is following the research. So we have carefully over time followed research really looked at individual needs of districts all over the place, and then really looked at um, how do you scale those things up and partner um, with universities. And so early on, those recruitment centers went away. We ended up getting another grant that allowed us to recruit in three regions, which included LA, San Bernardino, and the whole Central Valley. Um, I think at the time we recruited about 1,500 math, science, and special ed folks. And again, we went back to those same issues of really um, how do we customize um, that for every individual district? How do we make everyone feel that we are there to serve them? And um, how do we talk to one another because we all need one another? Hence, um, fast forward, the opportunity came um, when the centers closed. Um, I, I was an administrator for an intern program that had 22 interns. And um, using our recruitment strategies, that program was built up to 300. It was important that those interns were so well supported that they were gonna be successful from what we learned that now that program still stands. Um, they were really sought after and um, that's because of the quality of the program and um, not necessarily the pathway. I think all pathways, if you have the right supports and it matches the needs of individuals and that's an important thing also that we found that we needed to match those individuals, both with districts and programs, which we developed are what we call our Vortal, which is a platform that I would say um, is a kind of cross between Facebook for teachers and match.com. Um, um, a quick uh, example of that is a teacher puts in an area a zip code of where they wanna live um, and work. So if I'm at school in Long Beach, and I'll just use Long Beach as an example, but I want to go up to um, San Mateo, then all of the jobs because of our partnership with Eduane gets pushed to that individual. And they don't have to leave Long Beach with our virtual strategies to get connected. Um, as a result of that, over um, the last year and a half, we have recruited um, about 1,500 um, individuals. And we know the cost of that recruitment. Um, and we have been able to do it at a fraction, I think, of the cost of what it normally takes. But it takes partnerships. It takes really looking at how do we build this together um, over uh, uh, geographic areas that are both urban as well as rural and looking at those individual needs. Thank you, Donna. And, and uh, picking up on, on Lewis's statement about looking at the dollars that we have, the opportunities that are in front of us, um, what would you advocate, Jack, that, that, that the individuals listening to this today and that might be listening to it uh, after it's been recorded, what should these agencies do? Um, we, we do have an opportunity in front of us. We really do, Jim. And, you know, the glass is half full and it, it's just a, a once in a, once in a lifetime opportunity uh, for us. Uh, you know, we actually do, you asked me to give the historical perspective. A lot of people may not know, we actually have a law in the state for a minimum teacher salary. I might add it's a very well-written law. Wes, do you want to say who the author of that legislation was? Uh, I think it's a historically great SPI 
uh, Jack O'Connell. <laughs> and, and I tried to put a cola in it. And it, uh, Governor Davis was governor at the time and he signed the bill into law, but we were not successful with our cola. But you know, that's an area that we need to, to look at, you know, things like loan forgiveness. Uh, how can we get the proper support? Somebody, I think it was Tara earlier today, Jim, talked about this, the bucket of teachers and, it's, and, and there's a leak in it. And we need to, we can address this by keeping our teachers, uh, you know, make sure that they have the support that they need, prepare them. I, I remember when I first taught, you know, I mean, my department chair said it was, uh, you know, I remember it very well, it was said right after Labor Day, here are your textbooks, I'll see you June 15th, hand them in. And it was just, you know, it was sink or swim, you know, kind of a thing. But fortunately for me, it's the high school where I graduated from, so I knew my way around. And I still knew, you know, most of the teachers. But um, you know, there are a lot of things we can do. The last thing I'll mention is I'm a big advocate for class size reduction, and I'm not going to quiz Wes on this. But I authored the law when Governor Wilson was great coming up with a dough for K through three, and you know what happened? We had a dramatic increase of teachers that, that came into the profession then that were fourth grade teachers that wanted to teach into that area. But we have to value and respect our teachers. And just listening here, um, you know, a, a few minutes ago reminded me of a book. There's a book that's uh, out. It's about 10 years old. It's called, this is my prop, I guess, Jim. It's called uh, Signed Your Student. And, and I'm in it, but, and that's, and I don't get a, a nickel for anybody that buys it. But uh, it was an author. I remember when she called me and she said, I'm going to write a book about a bunch of, you know, well-known characters. And I asked one question, is there a teacher that really made a difference in your life? And you read this and it's emotional. And she had just talked to John Glenn, a former astronaut, US Senator, and he's talking about his, and there are Olympians, uh, movie stars who said, there's no way I'd have finished school without Mr. Or, you know, or Mrs. Uh, still in the program. I mean, you have Wes Smith on here. Uh, he's a very good football player. His coach, Wes Smith doesn't even know his coach's first name to this day. It's Coach Reed. I know, and I'm the same way with my basketball coach. So we need to respect our teachers. We need to do more to attract attract them to this profession. It is the most important profession in our society. We're the ones that teach doctors and lawyers and business people and politicians. Okay, sometimes we don't get it right, but but we need to make sure that we respect and value these folks in this profession. Thank you, Jack and and, and Rigel. Um, uh, again. To Lewis's question, we're going to have a lot of dollars that are that are at our fingertips. And what advice are you giving to LEAs, to leaders, to grant writers and recipients right now? You know, yes, there's there's a panoply of options and get in, in terms of recruitment and retention. A couple a couple new things um, that are on the horizon that I hope folks really see as ways to support, nurture, um, and enrich their workforce are around the. There's a proposal for 250 million dollars for national board incentives. So so folks who are national board certified to commit to teaching in our high need schools, um, as well as the 1.5 billion dollars proposed and again everything in negotiation right now but for educator effectiveness for a variety of purposes including mentoring for teachers um, building up skills around trauma-informed practices social emotional learning um, we want teachers to to feel like professionals in directing their own professional learning um, and growth, and I think these are a couple um, proposals in the budget that that get at that. And then, of course, as as, as Lewis said, there's just so much money. So beefing up these successful um, proposals that or successful initiatives we've had going around residencies and the classified staff um, um, and the Golden State teacher. So really thinking about how do we, you know, sit in our communities with the IHEs we have, with the community-based organizations we have, with the workforce we have in terms of our paraprofessional folks. You know, thinking about the, the young people that have been running learning hubs this year and who, who is out there in our community and how can we get them to come in to stay in and grow in education? I think there's a lot of different options in, in, in the proposed budget to, to have a real plan. Um, and I think another thing we're hoping for is um, there, are, there are proposals to um, make some hubs around the state, around HR, so we can really have experts saying, helping us navigate all these buckets and the different populations 
46,000 vacancies on EdJoin right now. We need, we need a multi-pronged approach um, for all of the different groups that have been mentioned. Um, and, and as much as we can get them from our communities, the, the stronger we're going to have in terms of retention and results. So um, those are a couple of the proposals that, that I think we're, we're excited about to see them land and, and folks to grab them and run with them. Thank you. And, and Hannah, you, you wanted to jump in there and then Lewis. Thanks, Jim. And I also want to build on what Tara mentioned in her presentation earlier. We have a lot of federal funds coming in. So how do we think creatively about using that to support things like housing and um, food insecurity, right? Um, I heard some comments about that in a previous breakout group on, around educated diversity and um, data collection. Like how do we make sure we have the data we need to know which initiative, initiatives are actually working, which are working well so we can grow them. Um, want to mention one example, the CSU Chancellor's Office has a learning lab where they're, they have five campuses collecting data on recruitment efforts of candidates to see um, which what's working and then they're going to try to use what they learn to scale that across the CSU teacher preparation programs. Thank you. Um, and, and Lewis, I know I, I teed it off with your question. <laughs> so so <laughs> well, I, I'll let you uh, respond briefly. Well, let me just say a couple of quick things on, and I do think because this is such a vast and, and could seem overwhelming, coordination is going to be so important. And I do see in the governor's proposal, he's proposing something called a roadmap to education, employ, educational employment program, which um, and I know Donna, your agency will be key in that, but to really have a coordinating body, and I'm hoping that that will be an effective uh, organization to to really have the big picture. Uh, and so it's not, it, people aren't working at cross purposes or, uh, so that's number one. There's two things that I hadn't really heard mentioned today, um, which I think is also important. And um, Cara, you may know where things are, but in terms of induction, retaining teachers, the, the BITSA program, which I guess no longer exists, called the California Induction Program. Um, and, uh, you know, there were big problems with that. It's patchwork, different districts are doing different things. And I think the research, uh, speaking to Hannah's point, is, is shows that this is really important that this to get, makes such a big difference in terms of them staying in the classroom. So I think uh, more attention is, is important on that end. And, um, and then the other thing that also had a lot of promise and really gets at the core of California's whole teacher preparation program, which is um, blended programs, integrated programs, where students can get their degree and their credential in four years. With the cost of college and the need, this five-year thing really is problematical, even though it may be the best in terms of getting fully trained people into the classroom. But uh, just again, looking at the numbers, um, not that many. I mean, it's actually declined from its high of about a thousand plus, you know, 10 years ago is now last year, it was 700 uh, people as young as students coming through that program. Uh, and so that to me seems like there's a lot of potential, could be more potential there in boosting those numbers, but it really means drilling down and seeing what's working and not working. One of the things when looking at the numbers, I see that the biggest percentage of the 700 are Latino, Latina students, um, teachers. So that's super important in terms of getting, addressing the diversity issue. At the same time, only a handful, literally a handful of African-American uh, participants in that program. So why is this program appealing to Latinos and not to uh, African-American teachers? But again, a promising program, we need to build on it and make it work better than it is already. Thank you, Louis. Uh, uh, Cara, and, and, and then Wes, just some final thoughts on that. I appreciate your um, calling out induction. Induction is key to teacher retention. You know, it, it goes back to that, what I was kind of referencing about embracing new educators into the community, um, the, into the LEA in which they have been invited. And I believe induction does that. Um, you know, the commission, the induction programs are accredited as our um, IHG programs are. And um, there are many, many best practices out there. 
And, you know, I was a, I was an induction coordinator for 10 years. And my first year, so I was like, oh, we have 100 new teachers this year. Isn't that great? And by year three or four, I'm like, why do we still have 100 new teachers coming in every year? I mean, at that point, you know, there should be some retention going on, right? And so I so appreciated um, Dr. Smith's comments about, you know, it's you have to get your house in order first, you know, invite your um, new teachers in induct them, embrace them, and, and carry on. So yeah, I appreciate this conversation this morning. Thank you. Wes, some final thoughts that you may have. Yeah, thanks, Jim. And, and if my internet's bad and I get choppy, just cut me off. Uh, my family does it all the time whenever I start talking. <laughs> uh, you know, Jack, Jack brought up some great points. I just want to highlight that. Loan forgiveness for teachers. Um, we, we, we're doing a lot right now. We can do a lot more. Um, uh, affordable housing for teachers and other educators. We, we need to make a lot of growth in that area. Mm -hmm. And a lot of you know, too, that CSB and AXA sponsored uh, a ballot measure that was polling in the high 60s. It would have brought $15 billion ongoing into public education, right? 42 out of 50 improved people spending. We, we don't value the profession like we say we do. Right. And, and we never have. And the one time money is great. But guess what? Then it's gone. Right. Let's do something ongoing. Um, let's make the profession a profession. Let's treat these professionals like other professions are treated. Uh, we need to address that in, in California. Um, there are some initiatives that have been out there. Let, let, let's do the right thing. We need the governor, the legislature to help with this. Uh, put it put it on the ballot. Let's do the right thing. And then I'll say this because, you know, Jack mentioned and he's right. We have to value the profession. I think we, we as a profession have an obligation to to make sure that we're not misrepresenting how we're being valued. Uh, if, if we are going to continue this narrative that no one values me, no one values me. Why in the heck would someone choose teaching? I, I mean, you know, listen to the narrative in your local communities and ask yourself, would I send my child to that job interview given the way people are talking about the profession? And so I think we have an obligation within the profession to say, let's represent accurately how we're being treated, uh, how the work is going, and then let's get the state uh, to, to fund this profession like our professionals deserve. Thank you, Wes. And, and I know we are, are up against the clock right here. So uh, I want to thank uh, Donna, the, the, the California Center uh, for Teaching Careers, for really uh, having the backside of this and the backbone of our, our program today, the, the commission for providing the funds through the Cal Ed grant program, and to let everyone know that the, the questions, the information shared today, the breakout sessions, the research will all be on the California Center for Teaching Careers website, as well as uh, the County Office of Education's websites as we share this out, and um, also with our associations with SUCESA and AXA. Um, so a, a, a big thank you to the panelists today for joining us, for providing your expertise and your, and your service to our state, um, to, to the nation to some extent, uh, in, in what you're doing and providing the information. Um, so uh, any, any final goodbyes or thank yous? I, I'm, I'm trying to be respectful of the time here. Jack, you always have a closing statement. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a great book on how valuable teachers are and how you make somebody's difference. So really do. Thank you, Dr. Brescher. Great job. Yes. Uh, and, and Donna, any last housekeeping or, or should I just say thank you to everyone and, and, <laughs> and we move on? Uh, your, your microphone, Donna. <laughs> I do want to thank everyone um, for being here because it's such an important issue. It is a time, the time has come for us to really invest in education. We have been at this, we've um, looked at structures, um, we've built them, they've broken down, and now is a time to sustain what we've started, the work that we knew was really important, and continue to make it happen. And we can do it. I mean, we recently started a residency program because we knew that that was really important to have a model for that. And so, um, you know, doing things like that makes a difference in sustaining 
initiatives because they connect with what's needed in the community and in education at large. And um, I think it's really about building that diverse pool um, and, and making the kids feel like there's a face like mine that's up in front of them and that we really together um, can be supporting them in their education and we care. Well, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you all of the attendees today, the panelists. Um, thank you to Superintendent Thurman and, and, and Senator Laird uh, and, and to Tara for the keynote address. So um, have a wonderful afternoon and thank you for your service. See you guys. Thank you all. Thanks Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks Jim. Go get Jack's book. Yeah. <laughs>